So I'm pretty excited about this. This is um, Ryan Woodcock, and he's going to be talking about spot patterns on spotted salamanders. And some of those might be some of the salamanders I helped cross some spring along the way. So I'm very excited to hear about this. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, wonderful people. Happy Saturday. Uh, the presentation I'm giving, you to, giving to you today represents a class project conducted at Madai University as part of our fall 2020 herpetology uh, lab. Um, the student co-authors on this presentation deserve full credit for their work in this process. I want to acknowledge their work. And I also want to acknowledge our iconic theme organism here, the beautiful spotted salamander. And so what you will see today represents data that is still being, uh, being uh, this is still an ongoing project, a live project. Nothing has gone to publication or peer review yet, so we, we do want to acknowledge that. But we should start off with herpetology. As we said, this was part of a herpetology class. Herpetology is the subdiscipline of zoology that deals with reptiles and amphibians, although they are two different groups. Um, they've been grouped together sort of by, his, by history. Um, our focus organism is a salamander, meaning that it has a, usually a tadpole, it has a tadpole stage, goes through a metamorphosis like a frog or a toad, not to be confused with lizards who are, uh, although have the tetrapod body design, have claws and so forth. So running a herpetology lab during fall 2020 was no uh, easy task. It was quite a, a messy problem. As you see, how do you run a lab during a pandemic? New York State had guidelines for, uh, under which Madai, Madai University operates, required field work, field experience. So how do we incorporate that when we're in lockdown, when we're uh, severely limited? And our salvation for our class came through cooperation with the Harris Center for Conservation Education. We have special thanks to Brett Thalen, our partner in this research, and we would not have been possible without this cooperation. So to start us off, returning to our iconic organism, our spotted salamander. It gets its name for these beautiful rows of bilateral spots, uh, North American species native to this region, native to Eastern North America. What, what though do we know about the spots? What, what is known? What is the story? Well, as you can see, the spot patterns on the salamanders are individual, as individual as fingerprints. We're able to recognize individuals from one salamander crossing to another and see that the same individual has been present for multiple years, multiple breeding migrations. But the salamanders aren't using their spots to identify one another, at least not as far as we know. What are those spots for? These are apparently a very important adaptation for their survival. This is a, a convergent trait that we see in other distantly related woodland salamanders, such as the European fire salamander, the northwestern salamander. This is a warning coloration, what we call aposomatic coloration. These, these yellow spots are warning a, pre a potential predator of a threat. Well, what would they be warning about, you can ask? These spots actually do warn about their toxic secretions, toxic defenses. So would-be predators are given a fair warning, don't eat me, don't mess with me, you would regret it. The, we see here the salamander releasing the toxic secretions. It's a mixture of natural isoprenoids, that's latex, um, some other interesting compounds mixed in which have yet to be fully described. So the, the classical understanding is these yellow spots warn against predation, but there are, however, some predators who have either behavioral adaptations or chemical adaptations to handle this. They know how to detoxify the salamander, they have the enzymes to do this, or they know how to behaviorally work around these toxins. So could there be more than just predation warning uh, in the spots? Well, other research to date has examined the actual individual spots, the circularity of the spot to see um, how circular the spot is and how does that compare to a measure we're going to call body condition, length to body mass. And there is a strong correlation to this. So salamanders who have very circular spots are apparently also, we're going to say in air quotes, healthier overall. And that, that does indicate that there's some other factors involved with either spot production. Is there more? Yes, definitely. Our, our understanding of this is still quite incomplete. So coming to our project now, 
you know, the question is, do these spots reveal maybe deeper secrets, deeper, pa uh, deeper patterns? As we say, what is the secret story written in the spots? And this brings us to our class project, part of a very large data analysis. And again, what I'm showing you here, this is just a sample of the treasure that we were provided by the Harris Center, uh, just a small portion of the archive of nearly 1,000 images going back until uh, 2015. Um, the citizen volunteers who work with the Salamander Brigade helping the animals cross, photo documenting this. I have to give full credit to this, to their work. This wouldn't be possible without citizen actions involved. The students in our herpetology lab, we work together, working, looking at this valuable archive of data and ask questions. What questions did we have? And the question emerged about symmetry, about handedness. So many things in nature have right or left handedness. Uh, you think about a snail shell. It's twisted or torted to the right or to the left in many species. So is there a similar relationship? Maybe there's a bias in the population. Or in other species, think about the eye spots of a peacock. Symmetry is very important as a sexually selective characteristic. So this, this initiated our research and our discussion. My students together, we, we looked at the data, we came up with a series of rules to analyze. We developed rules to measure spots to different body regions using the salamander's spine, its pelvic girdle, its, its shoulder girdle, uh, to define body regions, looking at the left and right sides of the animals. And each student worked as part of a team, a team of two, to were assigned a section of the archive to go through and count numbers of spots, the locations per each body region. And of course, working in pairs is always great to have someone to check your work. We did this together through a series of lab sessions, and sometimes anomalies emerged, sometimes things we weren't expecting to see, and we had to address, well, how do we count this? Do we have to maybe censor this data from our, from our collection? But overall, we were able to, to find a great deal of variety, and 746 individual, individual pictures were able to be included in our data analysis. That is an amazing amount of data. So as you can tell, I probably, at least see, I'm a data scientist. I work with big data, so I'm always amazed when we have uh, this treasure trove of data to work with. A data sample this large allows us to perform statistical analysis. It allows us to test hypotheses through statistics. And to this meeting today, I'm going to share to you just some of the secrets we've revealed and have been revealed to us in the spots, the patterns we see. We practice statistics on a daily basis. You may not realize it or may not think about it consciously, but calculating a percentage calculating an average, calculating a range, those are all statistics that are ways of describing a population or ways of describing a, a sample. And so our first question is, what kinds of averages do we see? What kind of ranges do we see on individuals? Uh, those are simple statistics. I'm looking at those body regions. So we did, find, we did not find in our sample set any spotless salamanders, though we know from oral reports that they do occur in this region. They weren't captured. We are missing some data, but we still feel that this is a really rigorous representative sample. So to start off here, I'm showing you what we'll call our Vitruvian salamander. This is our average salamander that uh, shows the numbers of average spots per each body region, and I'll try to draw here with my little laser pointer or pen, you'll notice that most regions mirror each other, with the exception maybe of the tail, where there is on average an extra spot. And if you look at the left versus the right sides, you see, well, those numbers are slightly different. And already now we have a question. Um, are those differences the reflection? Uh, this is an average for the population, but are those differences uh, a reflection of just our sampling, our, our way of measuring? Um, is there a really a left-handedness to the spots, or is there a right-handedness? Um, what about individual salamanders? This may be the population overall. So what do you think we found? Is the salamander left spotted or right spotted? Well, that was our first analysis. Looking at the data, we compared. And we saw, okay, maybe there's a real difference here, but statistical analysis indicated, no, this is probably the result of chance alone. So at least at the level of the population, if you sum all the salamanders together, there doesn't seem to be a right or left bias. If you were to look at other populations, perhaps just even handedness in humans, you would find a bias. So already we're seeing something unusual. There doesn't seem to be that pattern. Uh, so, but we want to look more closely. 
not just the population, let's look at the individual salamander. Maybe it's equal numbers. Maybe the equal numbers are set to the left, set to the right. So this leaves us with a pattern, a question. Uh, we have our null hypothesis, which is where we always start in science, the most conservative hypothesis is there is no difference. Everything we see is just the result of just chance variation. So there really should not be left-handedness to spots or right-spottedness. Just the placement of spots reflects individual variation. Everything that we're seeing is due to chance. Our alternative hypotheses would be what? right spottedness or left spottedness to the individual, that there might be true bias in the population, um, or some individuals have significant left spottedness and right spottedness. So again, our alternative is asymmetry. We're going, we first step, just plot the spots against each other, total spots for the body, left spots to right spots, and we see what here? A relationship that appears to be a cluster. We see a relationship that's clustered, and not just cluster, but sort of an upward direction. What does this mean? Uh, these data are proportional. As left spots increase, right spots also increase. They work together, and they're in fact very strongly positively correlated, about 61%. There is, though, a lot of spread in this data. This numbers are not, this is not a tight line, and there are some outliers. So the question is, how much, what about this variation? There's a lot of variation here. We took this to the next step. We looked at each individual salamander and ran a statistical analysis called chi-squared, which is your observed spot frequency versus your expected spot frequency, assuming, again, that they should be all variation should be to chance. How many individuals then were asymmetric? That is to say, that was most of the individuals. 99% of the population were symmetric. That's remarkable. That's a remarkable finding, indicating that there is very strong, there's a very strong presence of symmetry in this population. We did find two individuals who were strongly right symmetric, and we looked at those photos again. Yep, they were really spun to the right, but we found no left asymmetric individuals overall. So where does that take us? Again, we have to reject our alternative hypothesis. We, cannot, we, can, we will have to accept the null hypothesis that symmetry is the rule in the population and at the in level of the individual salamander, and that the presence of left or right spots where they are on the animal is probably just due to chance placement. But are there further details we can learn? Are there more secrets we can learn from the spots? Yes, yes it was. Students asked the question, well, you know, it would be really amazing, like why this variation? Is there some genetic relationship? And we took it that way, we took it that step further. I said, well, let's investigate as a class. What kind of pattern of inheritance would explain this variation that we're seeing? We suppose, our hypothesis was that this was a polygenic trait. Polygeny in genetics means many different genes contribute to this trait. We see polygeny every day in the human population. We see it in our height, we see it in our weight, we see it in our skin color. Polygenic traits exhibit what's known as a Gaussian or bell curve distribution. And so that was our prediction, that if, there's, if this is the result of many different genes, the numbers of spots is the result of many genes working together, we should see that kind of distribution in our population. And just to recap, for humans, this is an example of what a polygenic trait would look like. We, for instance, could take height, and you see you know, a few individuals who are, who are very tall, some who are very who are not so tall, and then most who fall somewhere in between. Many different combinations of genes can give you the same result for height, and so most individuals show up somewhere toward the center. And so what that would look like for the salamanders, we would expect then to see a few very rare individuals with very few to no spots, a few individuals with very high numbers of spots, and most individuals with some number somewhere in the center, somewhere in the, around the average. So I'll show you the data, you decide. Does that fit a bell curve distribution to you? What do you think? Yes, yes it does, at least by eye. That looks like a really good bell curve. It's noisy in some spots, there are some spikes. Uh, could this be the result of duplicate samples of individuals? Maybe. Could this be the result of oversampling at some locations? Maybe. But still, that looks like a very good bell curve distribution, at least by eye. We were actually able, based on the number 
of different classes, numbers of, of, of spots we observed, to estimate how many different genes might be involved. This is known as the 2n plus 1 rule in genetics. And it could be as many as 38 different genes that contribute to the numbers of spots. That's quite a lot of variation. Uh, in the population. Still a lot more work. This, would, this is a hypothesis that would need to be confirmed with a breeding study, but this provides the foundation for much more future research work. Now, as I said, this does by eye appear to be a bell curve distribution, and that's the distribution we would expect to see by chance alone, um, if this is a polygenic trait. But maybe it isn't. Maybe it's a little bit pushed to one way or another. If there are, could there be other factors involved if this is not a perfect bell curve distribution? Well, indeed, we could see a, a fa a shifts in bell curve distribution if there is natural selection involved in a population. So in a population where there is no selection, we say it's neutral, there's neutral selection, we would have a bell curve distribution that would just fit a bell curve, and any variation we saw was just due to chance sampling. But if we see a distribution that's shifted to one way or to the other, that would be a directionally selected population. Maybe having more spots is better for the animal. Maybe having less spots is better for the animal. We could have disruptional selection where the, the pattern is being shifted away from the center. Or we could see stabilizing selection where the extrema, those with very high numbers of spots and very low numbers of spots are being eliminated from the population and are in this, the, the, the population is being shifted toward the center. What did we find? Well, we analyzed this statistically. We, there is a test built to measure bell, fit to bell curve distribution and then see if it's shifted one way or another. And we found significant shift to the center. So what does that mean? We have stabilizing selection for average numbers of spots. Okay, so if you are a salamander who has a lot of spots, you seem to be at a disadvantage. There are far fewer of you than we would expect to see. If you're a salamander with very few spots, you seem to be at a disadvantage. There are far fewer of you than we would expect to see. And if you're an average spotted salamander, there are a lot more of you than we would expect to see. Why is that the case? So here we come to our conclusion, our, our sort of thinking as a class, interpreting our data, bringing it back to the real world. This is our, our hypothesis. We believe that these spot patterns are actually at sort of a, at the crosshairs of two different opposing forces. One, the need to hide out in your environment, to be cryptic in coloration, but two, the need to be aposomatic, to be able to stand out from your, and warn a predator. Those are opposing forces, right? You, to be able to hide and to be able to stand out are completely polar opposites. Well, what does that look like then? Salamanders with cryptic coloration who have very little spots, they unfortunately fall victim to would-be predators. Predators who are not adapted to eat that animal, who it will harm the would-be predator in this interaction and harm the unfortunately cryptic colored individual. On the other extreme, animals who have very strong aposomatic coloration and warn, I'm toxic, leave me alone, that's great to avoid those would-be predators, but adapted predators will be able to see you and take you out. And so they get eliminated from the population. Individuals who are somewhere in between have a pattern where at close range they stand out but at distance are more likely to disappear into the background, getting kind of the best, we think, of both cryptic coloration and aposomatism. So that is our working hypothesis for what we've emerged from our data. We, uh, again, this is again a student project, and I have to give all, all credit, great credit to the many students who could participate in this class project, but I also want to acknowledge the wonderful volunteer spirit of the Salamander Brigade. Please join the movement. This made this, this data collection for many years made this, process, made this project possible. We also want to acknowledge Brett Thalen, who was our, our, our coordinator, our connection point to the Harris Center, and again, I want to open it up for the audience for questions and comments. Thank you all.
Um, I can basic question, did you account for the possibility of the same individuals in your data analysis? Uh, we did not at this time. Um, that is on our priority list as this is an evolving, still developing project, and that is going to have to be round two for this project. The beauty is the collection of data by body regions, we believe, will give us a key to match individuals, to go back and then identify them. And we can, I don't want to say sterilize, but we can say we will clean up the duplicates in the population. My suspicion, and suspicion is just that, a hypothesis, not a fact yet, um, is that we will find that some of the, the spikiness in this graph will probably smooth out. So that is the next step, but very good. And great that we're all in the same, that we're, that great minds are thinking the same way. That is, oh. How does this research translate to other regions? We don't know, and that is a valuable question to ask, to partner with other groups and conduct the same. Once a methodology is set down, once this, this sort of, we, we, we what's the word? Um, yeah, once we have are able to design a, pro, design a sort of a, a model of how to do this, it would be the next step to try to reproduce this in other areas. Do we find the same pattern? We don't know. That's where we have to continue the, the research. Were all these spotted salamanders the same species? Yes. I did have a follow-up question for that. Um, I noticed that the ones that you show with no spots, I always call those Jeffersons, <laughs> not spotted salamanders. That is, there, are, there is a Jefferson salamander um, that does have no spots. It is a separate biological species. And uh, we did find some in our data set, but we're able to separate them. They differ in some of the number, in some, some small diagnostic features. Uh, I don't recall the features offhand, but I do remember we pulled out the textbook to say, let's check and make sure. We did check our work to ensure that, that they were, that they were all spotted salamanders if there was any ambiguity. Uh, but there are actual true spotted salamanders who do occur with no spots that match the, the correct uh, morphology for a spotted salamander. So there is such a thing as the unspotted spotted salamander. There is also the Jefferson salamander, which is a whole other population doing their thing. I wanted to ask about that last slide with that odd looking salamander. Oh, yes. This would be an albino spotted salamander. Uh, found in Ohio, uh, so not in our population, unfortunately. Uh, albinism is a trait that shows up very rarely in nature and natural populations because the albinos are so conspicuous. They are often eliminated from a population by predators. What is remarkable about this is the spots are present even though this individual is albino. Um, and so this indicates that the genes that are controlling the uh, production of spots are using carotenoid pigments and are operating separately from the genes for the melanoid pigments which make the black colors of the salamander. Salamanders actually, all salamanders are known to have three different types of color cells that, that give them their coloration that produce different pigments. Uh, the numbers of genes that tell those cells how to operate, however, is a whole other story we're looking into now. Or I'm going to uh, try to answer, okay. ask the question. So has there been an analysis of whether those with more spots or less spots or the right amount of spots live longer based on identifying them year after year? Did I get it? Yeah. That question has, that has, not been, that has not been addressed. It is possible to do so with the data we have, at least attempt this. I can't guarantee 
whether we would have enough repeat individuals. We don't know how many repeat individuals we have. The number, if we have any repeat individuals in the population, it will be possible, though, to estimate population size, to estimate how many salamanders are cycling through at these locations. Just want to add, we, so we started taking these photos, I'm Brett Thielen, um, we started taking these photos because we wanted to identify individuals to start to get a sense for survivorship. And so we have, through very painstaking, um, I'm looking at some of our interns who've helped with this, through very painstaking examination of many of these photos, identified at one of our sites um, just over 30 individuals that we've seen on more than one occurrence, and a, a few individuals at other sites. Um, we have not done any of the statistical analysis, so I think that would be a great Sounds awesome. class project for your class to follow Excellent. up. But our original intention of taking these photos was to get a sense for, over time, if we could get a sense for survivorship and, and kind of do a mark recapture without needing to actually mark the animals. So we have found some repeats, um, but there are still a very small percentage of the overall number of photos that we have. And there's much more data to be analyzed, so if anyone is super interested in looking at photos of spotted salamanders, please come talk to me. We have plenty of work for you in that regard. Thank you. Any other questions? I just want to put in a plug for this wonderful program of citizen scientists who um, I've been part of for a very long time. And it's a lot of fun, even though you're out on a rainy, cold day. Not so cold. Uh, cold night, yeah. And, um, and we're supporting this great research. Thank, Thank you, you, Ryan. Thank you.